Good morning, everybody. Good morning. Welcome to Just Church. Let us stand up and praise the Lord. And Happy New Year, guys. Woo! This is the first one of 2023. Yeah. <laughs> let's, yeah. let's go. <laughs> yeah. can do that on the paddle because it takes too long. One, two. chose me it's always been a mystery see all my life i've been told i belong at the end of the line with all the other not quite with all the never get it right but it turns out that the ones you were looking for all this time because i'm just a nobody trying to tell everybody all about somebody who saved my soul. Ever since you rescued me, you gave my heart a song to sing. Living for the world to see, nobody but Jesus. Living for the world to see, nobody but Jesus. Moses has a shaped fright. David bought a rock to a sore fight. You picked 12 outsiders, nobody would have chosen you to change the world. And the moral of the story is, everybody's got a purpose. So when I hear that devil start talking to me, saying, who do you think you are? Then I'm just a nobody, trying to tell everybody, all about somebody who saved my soul. Ever since you rescued me, gave my heart a song to sing. Living for the world to see, nobody but Jesus. Living for the world to see, nobody but Jesus. And if they all forgive my name, well, that's fine with me. I'm living for the world to see nobody but Jesus. So let me go down, down, down in history. Go down in history. As another blood, blood, faithful member of a family. So I ever want to be. And if they all forgive my name, well, that's fine with me. I'm living for the world. to nobody try to tell everybody all about somebody who saved my soul ever since you rescued me in my heart a song to sing for the world to see nobody but Jesus living for the world to see nobody but Jesus church. Um, Pastor Rachel will be bringing the message in a little bit. Pastor James will be doing the connection card and praying with us. And we are just so excited that you are here. So uh, a few announcements. Yesterday we had our men's breakfast, but in two weeks, two weeks, right? The 21st of January, the women will have their breakfast at 9 a.m. over at the Ray of, Ray of Light? Yeah. yeah, the Ray of Light Cafe over in Haverhill. Um, just some notes. Uh, and these are in, and actually if you didn't get your uh, lovely handcrafted newsletter that Pastor Rachel does. 
Uh, raise your hand and Don will bring you one. Oh, right back, right up here. Um, and on the back of this is all our announcement. Our Just Kids program is looking for teachers and assistants. So if you're interested in doing that, see Pastor James or Melissa, uh, Heart of the Father Life Group. Uh, I had accidentally put in the newsletter the wrong date. It's actually going to be on January 28th at 10 a.m. And if you want more information on that, see Crystal. And then uh, Celebrate Recovery is always on Tuesday nights over at the Ray of Light down in Haverhill. Meal starts at 545, large group 630, small groups at 730. And really, that's it. That's all the, all the uh, announcements for today. I really want to pray and just get us back in the heart of worship. So let's just come before the Lord. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for all that you do in our lives. God, we come here today to honor you, to be with you. We, we want your presence to be here, and we want your presence in our life. So, Lord, we just, we, we think about Christmas and how you chose to come and be here with us and just to uh, teach us and to uh, guide us and to, to befriend us and then, most importantly, to die for us. So, Lord, we come before you today grateful thankful sons and daughters of the king and we know that you have so much greater things for us Lord than we could even uh, expect in our own lives so we come before you and we just uh, ask that you would give us all that you have for us Lord we surrender our stuff to you today and every day God we, we, we need your spirit living within us just bringing us to a place of, of peace and joy and love so we, we come before you and we thank you and we praise you in the mighty name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Now let us rise and worship the Lord our God.
Thank you, God, because we are who we are because you say that we are. I thank you, Lord, because we don't have to, to listen to what the world says or even the voices in our head, God. Because your word says that we're chosen and we're never forsaken. So sing this faith song it says I am who you say I am and I feel that hits because in this world it will try to dictate and say who you are and how you need to be and how you gotta walk talk and act and what you want to get and possess but it's not about what the world is trying to sell you or tell you it's who I am to God it's who he says I am so when I'm looking for the right way or the right me I fall in the lines of the words and I read talk to him, just me and him, so I know who he says I am. So I don't have to fall for the fakeness and the wall that they want us to put up or the mask we're supposed to wear. I put it away because I'm me for who I am in his eyes and he loves us all the same. Jesus, you make the darkness true. 
Stay right here in this moment. We need to allow Jesus to take away the fears in our lives, Lord. Lord God, we need you to take away the fears in our lives. We need to trust that you really do make the darkness tremble. That you are the light, the light of the world that we can put our hopes in, that we can trust in. Just Church, how you guys doing today? Are you guys going to be a sleepy group or a lively group today? What's going on? All right. I know that the two guys back here are pretty lively, so that's a good start. That's a good start. Um, so my name is Pastor James. I have the pleasure to bring to you the connection cards. The connection cards are located on the seat backs in front of you. Um, if you're not new here, it's okay, you don't have to fill out the whole connection card, but if you are new, we would love for you to, so that way we can send you updates on what's happening with our church. 
Also on the back of the connection card is if you want to join a ministry team or if you want to join one of our life groups, that is a great way to just let us know. And underneath that is the prayer requests and the prayer requests we take very seriously here. You have a whole team that is going to be praying over your prayers all throughout the week. And guys, when we pray together, we're a strong family and it matters and it matters to God. We need to continue to just grow this family and grow the trust within each other. And that is one way to do it by telling us what you need help with. So that way we can pray for you. Um, I think that's it. So now I get to introduce to you Pastor Rachel. But before that, what I want to do is I want to just pray into the service. Lord God, keep our minds clear so that way we can hear your word. Lord God, allow us to focus on what you have to say to us through your word. Lord God, I pray for Pastor Rachel. I pray that, that you speak through her today. And it's in your name and in your glory, I pray. Amen. And here's Pastor Rachel. Kind of enthusiastic. <laughs> Good morning, everyone. It's so great to be here with you today. I know we are a light crowd today because there are still many of us who are on vacation. But I did go online right before I came up here, and there's a whole bunch of people watching online. So everybody watching online, hello, hello, we miss you. Um, good morning. It is great to be back with you. Happy New Year, everyone. I hope everybody had a wonderful Christmas and a wonderful New Year. Um, we have not been together since uh, Christmas Eve. We had our, all of our four kids home with us, um, not for Christmas, but for New Year's. So that was unbelievable. So it was absolutely amazing. Um, but it is wonderful to be back together with all of you. And we are starting a new sermon series today, and it is called Starting Strong. Now, I've got to say right up front, I'm not a huge fan of this whole kind of new year, new you type of a concept. But I do think the new year is a great time to reflect and kind of think about a course for the next year. We're never going to reach perfection this side of heaven, but that doesn't mean that we shouldn't take an inventory of how we're doing and see what we could be doing better to live in that abundant life that Jesus promised us, right? And what a great time to do that than right now. Because often, let's face it, it's New Year. I know many people make what? They make resolutions, right? That's what we do. And I don't, if, if you've made a resolution, that's great because that shows that we want to better ourselves, right? That's, that, that means that we want to do something better. We want some sort of change in this new year. Unfortunately, the bad news is that according to studies, you know I love my statistics here, 92% of New Year's resolutions are gone by Valentine's Day. Now, if you've been along, around long enough, you know that I like to complain in January about how crowded the gym is. But the solace in that is that by March, it'll be back to normal. There's no problem. So. <laughs> but it's like the Apostle Paul wrote in Romans chapter 7 when he said, I have discovered this principle of life, that when I want to do what is right, I inevitably do what is wrong. I love God's law with all my heart, but there is another power within me that is at war with my mind. This power makes me a slave to the sin that, I, that is still within me. Oh, what a miserable person I am. He says, I do what I don't want to do, and I don't understand why, and I think we can all probably relate to that at one point or another, right? I want to do something better. I want to spend more time in prayer. I want to exercise more. I want to stop smoking, whatever it is. I'm sure all of us can relate in one sense or another. And so we make these resolutions, right? These, these, these thoughts in our head that, okay, we're just gonna, we're, this is just gonna change in this next year. But we break them and there we are again. Oh, what a miserable person. I am, right? But then he asks this question. We start seeing um, a shift in his thinking because he immediately answers the question too. He says, who will free me from this life that is dominated by sin and death? Thank God the answer is in Jesus Christ, our Lord. Jesus, 
who can change us, who can deliver us, who can set us free. He's our source of strength, our healing, our hope. Jesus is the one who makes all things new. And it doesn't matter where you've been or what you've done. He makes all things new when we're in Christ. In fact, in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, 17, it says, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, the new creation has come, the old has gone, and the new is here. And so my prayer for this series is that we'll not only experience this abundant life that is available to us in Jesus, but that we will be able to live out in discipline those things that lead to a God-honoring, God-pleasing, successful life. Because successful people do consistently what other people do occasionally. And if that sounds familiar to you, that for some of you it should, because we talked about that in the sermon series back in 2021 called Setting the Course. And if you were here for that, you may be thinking, well, why are we thinking about this? Why are we talking about this again? Well, as I say all the time, we are inconsistent, forgetful people, right? We need reminders all the time. So we're going to have to revisit these types of concepts over and over and over. But this time, I want to do it a little bit different. Last time, we talked about being successful. And I want to use a different word this time. And there's a lot of different words that we could use. If you watched our remote service last week, we talked about the concept of flourishing, right? And that's not a word that we use a lot. Did, you know, have you ever had someone come up to you and, and they're like, hey, how are you doing? And he's like, man, I am flourishing. Like that, that's just, think about it next time. Come on, it's, I'm starting a trend here. So I'm flourishing, how about you? But it says in Psalm 92, the righteous will flourish like a palm tree. They will grow like a cedar of Lebanon planted in the house of the Lord. They will flourish in the courts of our God. They will still bear fruit in old age. They will stay fresh and green. The righteous will flourish. And I think sometimes we get a little bit confused about what righteousness means. Sometimes it's not the best word for us. We, we have some negative connotations sometimes. We think righteousness means perfection. Who are these righteous people that are out there? Who, who can be perfect? It's not me. I can tell you that right now. But that's not what righteousness means. Righteousness means those who are right with God through Jesus Christ, those who have been reconciled with God. Because every single one of us, we have sin. We're all sinful. By ourselves, we can't be right with God. We can't fix that. Only Jesus can. So righteous people, again, people who are right with God, they're close to God. They're consistently taking actions that help them grow, right? They've accepted and recognized the need for a Savior, and they share in the victory of Jesus overcoming death on the cross and bring life to us all. I mean, think about it this way. A lot of times we think of success in terms of financial success. And when you've got someone who is financially successful, they're free. They're consistently getting to do things that other people will only get to do occasionally or maybe even never. And spiritual success is no different. It's all about freedom. It's about experiencing things consistently that others may only experience occasionally or maybe never. So the word we're going to use instead of success is victory. Who doesn't want victory over those things that are holding us back? Who doesn't want to be victorious this year? Yeah, Val's like fist bumping in the back there. Yeah, We need to get a little bit more excited here. Everybody's so quiet. I hope that's because you're listening intently. But, but yeah, bring it. There you go. You know, that's my favorite. <laughs> so I want to look at our ultimate example of victory. And I don't think that anybody would argue that Jesus was not victorious. He pleased God in all he did. As a matter of fact, God told him that specifically in Matthew chapter 3, verse 17. It says, and this was immediately after he had been baptized by John the Baptist, it says, and a voice from heaven said, this is my son whom I love. With him I am well pleased. 
And that was before Jesus died on the cross, before he rose from the grave and offered each and every one of us here redemption and victory of our own. Yeah, Jesus was pretty victorious. And one thing I can tell you is that I am not aware of Jesus ever saying, I'd really like to spend more time in prayer. I'd like to spend more time with my Father, but I just can't find the time. I'm just too busy. I just, you know, these disciples, they're wearing me out. And Peter, he just gets on my nerves. So I just, I have too much to take care of. I can't spend more time with my Heavenly Father. He never said that. But what we do see consistently as Scripture is Jesus' habit of breaking away from the crowds, from the followers, even from his closest friends, to have intimate time, fellowship with God. So taking time to do things consistently matters. What we do matters. Setting good habits matters. And some of you, if you've uh, been in, studied business or leadership, you might have heard of Sean Covey, and he wrote a book called The Seven Habits of Highly Successful People. And in that book, he said, our habits will make or break us. We become what we repeatedly do. Now, we can probably attest to that, and possibly in the negative, right? If we repeatedly do things that negatively affect us, if we repeatedly eat junk food, if we ap repeatedly abuse our bodies with drugs or alcohol, or even if we have repeatedly think negatively. Remember, we did, a sermon, we did a sermon on that during our Peace of Mind series. These things see, sow those seeds of negative results in our lives. The opposite is also true when we can develop a way to repeatedly do things that can yield positive results, that can lead to lasting change. And in general, I think most of us probably have really good intentions, like we want to make a change. We make those New Year's resolutions, and nobody makes those resolutions thinking, I am going to fail at this. This is great. I'm going to make this resolution, and by February, I will be done with it. No, we want to do those things that yield positive results. But often we wind up like Paul. When I want to do what is right, I inevitably do what is wrong. So today we're going to start this series out just taking a step back and exploring some reasons why, some reasons why we don't see victory when we have such good intentions. And start, we're going to start talking about how we can take small actions to change that. So let's jump right into that. First, we tend to focus on the what, the goal, but we don't establish the how. We focus on the thing that we want, but we don't take the time to figure out how we're going to get there. And I always like to connect this to a biblical example, so I want to take a look at Daniel. And we actually did a sermon series on Daniel a while back, and that was uh, in May of 2021. It was a series called The Stand, so if you want to um, go back and take a look at that, um, all of our messages are online on our Facebook page, on our webpage, on uh, YouTube, so you can take a look at those. But Daniel, he's this fantastic guy, right? He's a very godly, godly person. And he consistently stood out. Among a bunch of other young men, Daniel consistently showed the leaders, and he was chosen by the leaders and recognized by the leaders that as godly and gifted and different. When he was thrown into a den full of lions, he was able to stand strong, trusting in God, and come out alive on the other side. And we look at that and we think, why? Why was Daniel able to do those things. And we have to look at Daniel's life before those things happen. Because among other things, he had certain habits in place that led to a life of faith and faithfulness. For example, for years and years and years, Daniel had predecided that three times a day, every day, he would stop and spend time with God. And this helped to shape him into that man of faith, able to withstand incredibly difficult circumstances, and to indeed stand out and flourish through them. Because here's the mistake we tend to make. We tend to think, I want 
to change. I want this result. I want whatever it is, a deeper relationship with God. I want better relationships with others in my life. I want to succeed financially. I want to be healthier, whatever it is. But we don't necessarily take the time to change the habits that create those results, right? If you want to lose 20 pounds by Easter, or if you want to pay off your credit card debt that's been plaguing you, you can't just keep eating what you've been eating and not exercising. You can't just keep spending as you've been spending and not change your habits. We have to make a change. We have to create new habits, small changes that create lasting results. So we're going to talk more about that in the weeks to come, I promise. We're going to get some practical spiritual principles to help create these habits. This is just kind of a tease to get you warmed up. But right now I'm going to bring us back to the three reasons we're often not victorious. So the first, again, we focus on the what, we focus on the end goal, and forget about the how, what we need to do to get there. Second, we give up too quickly. Right? We talked about that 92% of our New Year's resolutions fail by mid-February. That's a month and a half. And I believe most of those fail because we don't see the results fast enough, right? We're impatient. We want immediate results. You know, you go to the gym and you walk on the treadmill three days a week, and, and, and maybe at the end of that week you wind up gaining two pounds, and you think, man, this just doesn't work. Forget it. It just doesn't work for me. I just can't lose weight. Or, or maybe you make time and you read your Bible for four days straight, and you go to church two weeks in a row, and then... You go home and you get in an argument with your spouse or, or, or your landlord does something unfair to you. Something negative happens in your life and you're like, man, this God thing is broken. This, isn't, this just isn't working for me. But change takes time. And the truth is that lasting results in our lives are a direct result of small actions that we have to take consistently. These things don't happen overnight. Big changes are a result of small decisions that we make along the way. Let me give you some examples here. Back around, I don't know, 1998 sometime, John had a car accident. It wasn't a bad car accident, but it was bad enough that it totaled our car. And we did not have a lot of money at that point. That was an overstatement, okay? We were dirt poor. We were house poor at that point. We had bought a house, but we had very little expendable income at that point. And so we needed the money from the insurance company to have a down payment just to get another car. We had two little babies at that point, and, and we needed to be able to get to work. And so this was a real problem. And the insurance company came back to us and basically said, sorry, your car's not worth hardly anything. And, well, we had to do something. And so I started researching. I researched the law. I researched the value of the car. I got everything in line, and I got on the phone with that insurance company. And I talked to them. And I talked to them, and I talked to them, and I talked to them until they recognized that that car was worth almost $7,000. And at that point, that was a big chunk of change for us. <laughs> and so at that point, that made me realize, hmm, maybe there's something here. Maybe I have something that I can do with this. And in 1999, I started law school. And went into law school with two little babies, came out with four. It was a lot of hard work, a lot of years, a lot of difficulties. But 20 years later, that one small incident leading to a whole bunch of decisions created financial freedom for our family, allowed us to do things that we wouldn't have been able to do otherwise, allow us to do this ministry, allow John to work full time in this ministry and not take any resources away from the church um, because we have financial freedom to do that. Another example also in 1998, it was a big year for us, um, John's dad passed away at the end of the year. And uh, John had to make the decision that he could get bitter or he could get better. And so he just started seeking and just trying to figure out what happened. You know, my dad one of his best friends, so close to him. It was such a hard time. And he just started seeking and trying to figure out what is happening here. What's, what's the purpose? Where is my dad? And it was a long process, and he read everything. He read 
Dianetics, he read the Koran, he read the Torah, he read everything you can possibly imagine. Um, and then in the year 2000, early in the year, he got to um, chapter 5 of the book of Matthew, Sermon on the Mount, and Jesus got a hold of him. And he became a sold-out Christ follower, which I was not really happy about because at that point I really didn't have a lot of time or energy for Jesus. But um, six months later, uh, I had to make the decision that either we were no longer going to be married or I was going to get on board with that. And Jesus got a hold of me. And our lives have never, ever, ever been the same. So what you see here today is a result of a lot of small decisions. In fact, if we fast forward to 2008, we were having a really hard time, just kind of in a slump, just really didn't know what was going on. And I was walking around a, a, one of those big bookstores, and, and I thought, all right, I'm going to become a vegan. That's great. And I had this big vegan cookbook. I was like, that's what we're doing. This is awesome. And it's one of the only times I ever heard God speak to me audibly. And he said, put the book down turn around. And I turned around and I was in the sports and leisure section. Now, if you knew me back then or before then, you would know that sports, leisure was definitely my thing, but sports was definitely not. And God said two words to me. He said, just run. And I thought, well, that's crazy. I'm not going to do that. Um, but then I found a book and it was actually a, 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 a humorous book. It was, it was labeled as humor slash sports and so I said, okay, I can do humor. That's great. Um, and it was like the Couch Potatoes Guide to Marathon Running or something like that. I don't know what it was. Um, something to that effect. And I picked that book up. And uh, I read it, and it was hilarious. It was a great book. But in the middle of it, it had a marathon training guide. And I thought, all right, well, whatever. You know, we'll give this a try. And so I started going out, and I would do, um, you know, I mean, I couldn't run at all. So I'd be like, all right, I'm going to run to that driveway. You know, and then I would walk, and then, you know, I would go out for a couple of a few minutes, you know, ten minutes or so, and eventually, um, you know, I would go out and I would, you know, run for a minute and then walk for five minutes or whatever the case may be. Well, long story short, eventually I was able to actually run two miles, you know, and then two miles turned into five miles, and five miles turned into ten miles. And in 2011, I ran my first half marathon. Um, but then, on the, one of those really, really cold, long Saturday mornings, when I would be out for 10 miles by myself, God spoke to me. And he said, I know we've been doing this running thing for a long time now, but here's the real plan. And he laid out my whole call to ministry. And I had no idea that was the plan. He knew that was the plan, but I didn't know that was the plan. And through all of that time, what he revealed to me was, I wasn't teaching you how to run. I wasn't um, wanting you to run out, go out and run races. But I needed time with you. I needed time to speak into you and to do things in your life and to break strongholds of poor body image and, you know, weight issues and eating issues with food. He needed time to break those things down. But it started with small decisions to make different changes and to be obedient. I mean, you may look at John and I and think, man, they've just got it all together. First of all, we don't have it all together. I don't know if you think that. Maybe you don't. Maybe you're like, wow, it's a hot mess up there. But, um, but if you do ever look at us and think, man, they look at it all together, <laughs> first of all, we don't. Second of all, what you see is a culmination of years and years and years of decisions and actions and habits. Think of it this way. Have you ever watched water boil? It's not thrilling, okay? You put it, you put it on the burner. <laughs> you put it on the burner and you turn it on high or whatever, and it sits there, and it sits there for a while, right? And you may not see anything happening from the outside, but slowly it's getting warmer and warmer. And eventually it gets up to 211 degrees. And you know what happens at 211 degrees? Nothing, you have really, really hot water. 
But you know what happens at 212 degrees? You have boiling water. You didn't see what was happening before that, but their water was being changed. And it's an awful lot the same with us. Something that John says an awful lot, you might have heard it if you've been around for a while, is that we have to be long-suffering in the same direction. And man, if that's not true here in this church. <laughs> Last week we did a best of uh, just church. I don't know if, uh, if you all saw that or you saw the graphic that went with us, but um, we've worshipped in how many different places did we figure it out? Seven, seven different places. And I'm not just saying like we went there and worshipped. I'm saying like we have, have held worship um, consistently in seven different places um, over the life of this church, which has only been around for three and a half years. Um, so it has been a journey. This place is a result of being long-suffering in the same direction and being faithful and continuing good habits and good disciplines. One small action at a time can lead to that victory. Paul spoke to this when he talked to the believers in Galatia. And in Galatians 6, 9, he said, Let us not become weary in doing good, for at the proper time we will reap a harvest if we do not give up. Let's not become weary. I know it's easy to do. This world is hard. Just do the next right thing. So why do we tend not to reach victory with our goals? Number one, we focus on the what and not the how. Number two, we don't see progress fast enough, so we quit too soon. And number three, and this is a big problem, we connect our failures to our identity. We often think that failing makes us a failure. We associate the lack of success with who we are. I did bad, so I am bad. And remember that. That's where Paul was originally going in that verse we read in Romans chapter 7, right? I try to do what's right, but I don't do what's right. Oh, what a miserable person I am. That gets the best of us, right? And when we look at some of the most effective people in God's word, we see people who battled this, who battled identity issues of thinking, I am a failure. Take Moses, for instance. Moses is one of my favorite examples of this, and he brings us one of my favorite pieces of scripture here. When God calls him, he pulls out every reason why God can't use him, why he's not right for what God's calling him to do. God has shown him miraculous signs, by the way, at this point. But he still says, listen, I'm not a good public speaker. I'm not a good leader. And then in one of my favorite verses, in Exodus chapter 4, verse 13, it says, but Moses said, pardon your servant, Lord. Please send someone else. <laughs> you have no idea how many times I've wanted to quote this scripture. Please, Lord, send someone else. Can you imagine that? God has revealed himself to Moses in crazy ways, shows him these miraculous things, and Moses' response is, I am not your guy. Go find someone else. He identified his shortcomings, his failures, with who he was. But eventually he followed God's calling, and he led his people out of slavery in Egypt. And he's one of the pillars of faith in the Old Testament. But we still tend to do the same thing, right? We decide things about ourselves that limit us. We decide, I'm not good with money. I might as well just go out shopping so I can deal with it, right? I'm not a disciplined person, so I can't, I can't lose weight. I, I, I can't save money for that vacation. I'm not good with relationships. I'm never going to find someone to, to share my life with, right? Hey, here's one I love. I get this one all the time. I have a short attention span. I can't pay attention in church long enough to hear the message. The music's great, but I just kind of get lost after that. Oh, man. My beloved, please hear this. With God, all things are possible, okay? <laughs> and you are selling yourself short. God has great things for each and every one of us. We may all have weaknesses, for sure, but that does not mean that we can't be victorious. We take our identity from who God says we are, not from our failures, 
And I'll tell you right now, if we have an unhealthy identity, it creates unhealthy habits. If we see ourselves as incapable, we won't do what it takes to accomplish goals. If we don't see ourselves as godly, we tend not to live in a way that is godly. If we don't see ourselves as righteous, and remember that's right with God, not perfect, we often live in a way that reinforces that. And the cycle becomes very, very negative. So that's why this year, I'm hoping we can start off doing something very, very different. I'm going to ask you not to start with the what, what it is you want. I want to lose 15 pounds, or I want to be more healthy, or I, I want I'm, I want to, you know, pray more, or whatever the case may be. Don't start with that. I want to shift our focus and start with the who. Who do you want to be becoming this year? Start with something like, I want to be a true man of God. That's a great who. You might say, I want to be someone who lives clean. I want to be sober. That is fantastic. I want to be a godly mom to my kids. I want to be a sacrificial spouse. I want to be financially free so I can be more generous. I want to be a bold witness to other people about what Jesus has done in my life. And these things may take time to develop. But if you can establish who you want to be becoming, then you can start thinking about the how and the what that we need to do to be who God called us to be. Think about it this way. If you want to quit smoking and all you say is, I'm a smoker, but I'm trying to quit, you have just connected your identity with who you are with your negative habit that you're trying to get rid of. On the other hand, if you say, I have been a smoker, but I don't want to smoke anymore. I'm not going to do that anymore. That part of me is done. Doesn't mean it's going to happen overnight. You might have some setbacks. Think about water boiling. But if you keep saying it, small decisions, small actions, identity shapes our actions. So this week, I'm going to ask you, and this is in your, um, think about it, in your handout. Think about your who. Who do I want to be becoming this year? And don't just go out there and start without a plan. Don't start with the do, start with the who. Who is God calling you to be at? And as we leave, I want to just leave you with this scripture. Um, Again, we're in the book of Romans. This is from chapter 8. And chapter 8 is a powerhouse, man. Let me tell you, I would encourage everybody to go home and read the entire chapter of chapter 8. I'm just going to read you a couple of verses here. This is chapter 8, starting in verse 37. And Paul writes, No, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am convinced that neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons, neither the present nor the future, nor any powers, neither height nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will ever be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen. We are more than conquerors. We are victorious in Christ, and nothing can ever separate us from his love. We have been given the right to be victorious, to be righteous, to be right with God through Jesus' death on the cross, his redemption through his, our redemption through his blood to bring us back to God. But we want, we have to want that victory. We have to want that lasting change and those positive results in our lives. And we're going to talk more about that next week. Let's pray. Father God, we thank you for the opportunity to be here together today. We thank you for the opportunity to come before you, to spend time with you. God, it really is just a privilege. And I pray, God, that you would do a work in us, stir each one of us up to have great goals, to have great things that we want to better ourselves. But God, first, this week, I pray that you would just walk alongside us, just be right there with us as we determine who it is 
that you're calling us to be. And God, may we take our identity from you and who you say we are and not who this world says we are or who we say we are in our own minds. Let us pay attention to the things that you're doing around us. Let us make the next right choice. Let us be focused on your will and not our will. And I just thank you that in the weeks to come, just positive things are going to flow, overflow out of that who, who it is you're calling us to be. And I thank you, God. I thank you for all your promises, your promise that we are more than conquerors, that we can be victorious through Jesus and his work on the cross. And I just lift up anybody here who doesn't know that they know that they know that they are righteous through Jesus Christ. And I just pray that we could just say words together and lift our hearts up to you together. There's no magic to it. We just lay ourselves before you. We just surrender and say, God, I know that I'm a sinner. I know that I need you. I know that I need a Savior. I accept what Jesus did on the cross for me. I give you my life. I give you my heart. Thank you. Show me who it is that you want me to be becoming this year. God, we thank you. We praise you. We worship you. We lift all of this up to you. In the name that is above all names, the mighty name of Jesus. Amen and amen. All right, as we close out our service, uh, we're going to have our last song in just a moment. And before we do, I'm going to hand this back over to Pastor John. Awesome. Thank you, Pastor Rachel. What a great message. I don't know about any of you. Yeah, right? Give it up. She's, um, I will say, I feel like she wrote that just for me. So, Because uh, it really is speaking to me, and she also made me cry. But... Um, uh, I'm up here to talk about the offering. Some things I just want you to know. Uh, in, our, in your newsletter, there is a place that you can, uh, on the third page, that you can scan to go to our Just Church uh, giving page. Joe's got it up on the screen. Thank you, Joe. Um, but one thing we wanted you to know, you also have these beautiful envelopes in front of you. And if you are going to use the envelopes, please put your name there, name first and last name there clearly so that Linda can record it because we're going to be doing our donation letters at the end of this month for last year's donation so that you have tax uh, deduction. Uh, and so to do that, to get you credit for that, we need to know who you are. Um, so you can fill those out, you can do it online, uh, and uh, Linda tracks all that stuff for us, and thank you, Linda, for doing all that work. She does a great job. The other thing that uh, um, Andrew wanted me to mention, another way to donate to the church is through uh, our homeless ministry often needs sandwiches and snacks and clothing and stuff like that. So if you have uh, any interest in doing that, see Andrew, he's in the tech booth right now, but, uh, and he will help you get connected with Jerry and Miranda who are out there serving the Haverhill homeless community. But that's all the um, business of the offering. But let's pray over our offering. Whether you give online or you give here today, Don and uh, Kristen are going to come around and take our offering during our last song. But I just want to pray over it right now because we give to God. And uh, yes, you give to the church and the church needs money to do things. But really you're giving to God so that we can provide um, what, what others need out there. And it, it fuels our ministry to be able to bring the good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ to those around us. So let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you. Thank you for the opportunity to serve you, God, to be one of your children. And that now that we have this great faith uh, in Jesus Christ, uh, that we want to share that with the world, Lord. So help us to be bold and get out there, Lord. And, and we, we give back to you through, because we know that you are blessing us. And, and we want to give you our first fruits. Um, we want to take the tithe uh, of our, of our um, income and be able to provide it back to you, Lord, so that you can do a great work in this world and that you would bless others and you would bless uh, you know, those in need through our offering and through our generosity. We know that you uh, create such 
um, wonderful things with, with what we give you, Lord. You take it and you magnify it and you, and you are able to bless people in amazing ways, but it's only through our uh, offering that you're able to do that. So, Father, we give to you generously and faithfully. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right, I'm going to ask the worship team. Oh, they're all ready, so let us worship the Lord our God.
did it for me, he can do it for you. If he did it for me, he can do it for you. That means what he did for another, he can do it again. That means what he did for another, he can do it again. So get up, get up, get up, get up out of that grave. Come on. Get up, get up, get up. Get up out of that grave. Don't stay there. Get up, get up, get up. Yeah. Get up out of that grave. Come on. Get up, get up, get up. Get up out of that grave. Get up, get up, get up. Get up out of that grave. Get up, get up, get up. Get up out of that grave. Get up, get up, get up. Get up out of that grave. Get up, get up, get up. Get up out of that grave. If he did it for me, he can do it for you. You picked me up, you turned me around, you placed my feet on solid ground. I thank the master, I thank the savior, because you heal my heart, change my name, forever free. I'm not the same, I thank the master. I think the same. What do we think? I thank God. Amen. God, we thank you so much for the opportunity to be here together today. I pray your protection on each and every one of us and all of our families as we go from this place until we can come back together and worship you again in spirit and in truth. And we lift all of this up in the mighty name of Jesus. Amen and amen. As always, it is a privilege and an honor to worship with each and every one of you. Have a wonderful, wonderful week. Love you all so much. Amen. You pick me up.